under the latter directive that we have had a partnership with JPCC South Africa for hmm, about 14 months. Um, what I'm going to do, as you can see, my, my paper speaks to this 14 months of work on our national adaptation plan, or as it's known here, the South African National Climate Change Response Policy, which is actually a mitigation as well as an adaptation plan. Um, I'm going to try and, being this is almost the end of COP and looking forward to the next year, to try and hit a level somewhere between CAM and strategy. So I'm not going to talk much about our actual work um, that we've been doing in, in relation to this policy, but just more of what, what is it that we've learned or not learned um, when CG Agenda CC South Africa sits down in January to discuss the continuation of this partnership. What are the kind of things that I will then like to bring to the attention of, of ourselves as we begin to do our planning? So, so that's the level at which I'm going to pitch my talk. If you want to ask me about what we actually did, I'm glad to talk about it, but in 10 minutes, we have something like 110 pages of submissions we submitted three times. We've done over 30 workshops, everything from under three grassroots to meeting with ministers in the president's office. So, so we're rather tired. Um, but onwards and forwards to the next year's work. I've just used the notion of a rainbow and colours to try and energise us a bit. Um, begin by talking about the earth and being as this is almost the end of the 60 days of violence against women, wanting to make that link, the earth is the biggest victim of gender-based violence, the pollution and carbon emissions is a form of patriarchal violence against the earth itself. And like all forms of gender-based violence, it's an exercise of power designed to exacerbate vulnerability. Abusers abuse because they can, and I'll get back to this idea in a little bit. Um, in two countries of the world, if I said that, that would literally be a legal concept. Following the Cochabamba Declaration of 2010 in Bolivia and Ecuador, Mother Earth is now a juristic person, which is fascinating for lawyers and they can talk endlessly about it. But she has legal rights, amongst which are the constitutional right to dignity and the right to be safe from violence. This reflects both indigenous peoples who urge to act in a feminist consciousness. Um, I go on to talk about, and I won't go into depth because this is an argument that organic farmers have been making oh, for at least the last 50 years. I think most famously, maybe eat Balfour in the living soil. Quite simply, if we don't take care of the soil, we're not going to survive as a species. Um, because the only difference will, you know, if you drew the point of feminism. So I name the system and I call it patriarchal capitalism and I link it to violence against women and indigenous peoples. I think that's really my brown point. Um, purple and of course with respect to Alice Walker, womanism is to feminism as purple is to lavender. Um, I think what I'm trying to say is the kind of work we have to do around gender and climate change really requires passion. Um, I'm, I'm very weary of pastel forms of discussion. Um, I think they need it, there are times and places. When you visit the president's office, you wear high heels, okay? But if there's not a purple heart under that, then you're really going to burn up very quickly. I think that's what I'm trying to say with purple. Um, carrying the notion of violence against the earth forward, I talk about oppressors exercise oppressive power just because they can. And in this sense, gender based violence. It's not about hatred or anger, although of course it may feel like that and is always personal to the press. Um, and if you want to know more about these ideas, the book would really inspires me, Sarah Schulman ties it by um, families and homophobia. She makes a long argument about how this notion that if gays and lesbians just pretend to be normal people, then homophobes will stop expressing homophobia. And she goes, no, the reason why homophobia why homophobes are homophobic is because there are no social sanctions. There's nothing that stops them from being homophobic, which for me is a really interesting approach to the exercise of patriarchal violence. Um, carrying us into climate change, I'm trying to argue the notion of carbon is limited because it's economically rational, may well be meaningless. And of course, we're getting more and more studies about the clean economy. Very interesting what's coming out of the United Nations, pointing out that if we want to get out of this recession or depression, we really have to invest in a clean economy. And if we don't, we could stay right here for the next century or so. So, you know, this is where the notion of violence leads me. I think the notion that capitalism is perpetrating carbon emissions because it's making money from it really doesn't hold true, both in a theoretical 
empirical sense. What are the consequences of that analysis if we start to think of <coughs> Shell or uh, BHP Billiton as perpetrators of violence against the earth and against women? Where does that take us strategically and theoretically? Um, is the language of economic nationality really going to help us to naturalize patriarchal violence? And here I think our foremost homegrown black feminist series, Debsa Lewis, has a lot to say about this. Specifically in her work around local government and gender, um, she says, beware technocratic language. Um, search for an authentic feminist language before you get lost in the bureaucracy. I'm a little bit fluffy. I think technocracy is a good language to speak when you're a technocrat or when you're speaking to technocrats. But I think if we forget our feminist purple heart, if, if we forget our mother tongue, then, you know, we're going to be sending out help, help bottles going, feminist lost in the bureaucracy, can't say me, please. <laughs> it's happened. Continuing the analogy of gender-based violence, should we be considering women's shelters, the analogy of ecological shelters? Should we be having counseling for mothers? Should we be providing lawyers? Um, I leave it to you, but my last point is to the emotional and financial abuse. Um, you can think about that. Green feminism has got to be blue. Um, in pretty much every one of our workshops, but obviously our grassroots community workshops the most, Women continue to identify climate change with other forms of pollution, most often air and water pollution that they're daily experiencing. They flatly refuse to distinguish between global warming and other forms of unsustainable development. No matter how many times you explain about carbon emissions, they, they're refusing to segregate. And I think on the whole, that's a good thing. I think the notion that, that we're part of a system, that, that carbon emissions is the extreme end of a number of different violations of women's environment makes a lot of sense. And and from this perspective, ending carbon emissions has to go hand in hand with a lot of other measures. So definitely from this country and from the women in this country, we, we can't think of carbon emissions as a scientific concept. And, and there's nothing particularly new about this. We have to build capacity at local level. We have to bring women into the global economy on equal terms. We have to strengthen local self-sufficiency. And, and so we cannot talk about climate change without talking about social economic and gender issues. Um, and if we don't do that, well, just mention CDM as a system that makes the rich richer and the poor poorer, and how do women really benefit from that? The flat answer is they don't. Um, certainly speaking from the, and I do believe he has been from the local south, you cannot go to a rural village and say to women, you're going to have to cut your carbon emissions, and by the way, you're going to stay as poor as you are. So the notion of increasing levels of human well-being while cutting carbon emissions not something that's negotiable. Green feminism needs to be whiter than white, and this reminds you of all the soap powder ads you've ever seen, that's exactly the analogy. Corruption being a huge problem, as you know, in fact, yesterday our national government at this point is administering four provinces um, due to, or provincial departments due to various forms of maladministration. Um, so clean administration becomes a feminist issue. Um, it's all very fine to get words into policy documents, but what are we doing if the money never actually reaches the women, or for that matter, never actually cuts carbon emissions? Um, so I think in short, what I'm saying is when we design a carbon finance system, we have to design one that actually works. I mean, the money actually has to go for what it's intended to go for. This might sound really obvious, but it's not that self-evident in the global south. Um, one of the concerns that I have is around designing systems that are workable. Um, South Africa produces something like one PhD per half a million people. So in terms of the real skills, are we going to be designing carbon finance systems that require much higher levels of skills and capacity than we actually possess? And if we do that, what does that mean? We're going to import the brakes from other African countries, we're going to be doing that, import the brakes from the global north. Um, so, so yes. <laughs> We design these systems, can we do it within certain socio-economic realities? And again, this might be obvious, but I think it's a point worth making. Um, thank you, almost done, and yeah. Referring to my metaphor of gender-based violence, corruption is a form of economic violence, but really remember what we're here for is to cut combinations and not make people rich. Um, one of the real learning experiences around building this coalition 
the pets we lobbying around the National Climate Change Response Policy is a deeply um, I think particularly in South Africa, the radical left the fact that the trade union, which is part of the ruling party alliance, has come over to the green side. This has really been amazing. Um, when this national, the first version, the pre-green paper version of this policy, was almost purely scientific. Um, it was very really interesting that the Department of the Environmental Affairs has the highest rate of gender equality in government, but the technical team that wrote the policy had only two women, one of whom was very junior, so <laughs> that was an interesting situation. So when we started, there was no social and economic factors. There are now. The problems were that, and I love this quote from Gloria and Saldua, um, the activist is aware that not only is the Alliance Coalition struggling to make specific changes in certain institutions, but in doing so, the group often engages in fighting cultural paradigms, the entire baggage of beliefs, values, and techniques shared by the community. And I'm pleased to see that the Colombian and the English and the Indian experience is very similar. You're operating with changing social norms, whether it's about women's access to land, or women's ability to speak in meetings, or women being leaders on water committees. Simultaneously with cutting carbon emissions, you're having to change patriarchal norms around in this proper place. So lastly then, um, I'm not sure whether to call these failures. I don't think gender and climate work has been going on really for long enough for us to be able to judge what is a success or what is a failure. So simply statements of fact. And as you know, the next round of our national policies are to translate it into law. So for 2012, we have not so far succeeded in getting discussions of power, inequality, and systematic violence into the technocratic language in which the, the proposed bill is written. Um, this coalition we built, like I said, is a fantastic coalition, but it requires an enormous amounts of mostly unrecognized emotional work, and it's really sustainable. If you look at any South African clean feminists at the moment, we're all looking rather tired, and can we keep it up for another year? Those are purely organizational, institutional issues that we really need to begin to ask ourselves. Building even solidarity amongst women is hard work. What we have here is a cross-class, cross-race, cross-gender alliance. It drains us. Um, and of course one of the things we're not really doing is spending a lot of time on building a very powerful green feminist movement. We just don't have time. Um, I think I've got 30 seconds left, so running through this very quickly. But because gender-based violence is also a process of preventing identity formation, enough pain that you stop working on things like who am I, what am I about, what is my task in the universe. And so a lot of the work that we're doing through this process is just simply empowering women, just simply saying, look, government is not going to come here and deliver a green economy. What is it that you can do, whether it's a cooperative, whether it's a food garden, whether it's we've got one group that's saving for biogas digestion. A lot of the work that we're doing is saying we need to meet government hard halfway. And again, I don't know if this is a South experience, but it's easy to assume that government has capacity to do doesn't. This is a young nation. We're only 18 years old. And even a lot of times government officials come to us and say we don't know enough about climate change. We don't know enough about gender. Um, so yeah, it's, this is something we don't say really loudly, but really building this green economy involves ending violence both against the earth and against women and ending the real transfer of power from the people that have to the people that have not. Thank you.